Hi, this is Miss Slitton, and this is my wonderful, wonderful period five AP Biology class. And you can't see what I'm trying to show you. And we're going to continue on into chapter 45, um, Community and Ecosystem Ecology. And where we left off last class is we were just getting ready to check to see how you were doing. So could you log in? as something you need to review on for your AP exam, which is in less than two weeks. Go ahead. Log in that way, and I'm going to go ahead and pause you. What do I need? Okay, let's see how you did. Oh, almost got 100%. Somebody said E, both A and B. So let's differentiate with, between herbivores and autotrophs. What do autotrophs do? Make their they can photosynthesize. Now, do all autotrophs photosynthesize? No. What's another kind of autotroph? Chemoautotroph. Where might you find a chemoautotroph? Hydrothermal vents, is that what you're saying? Excellent. All right. <laughs> so, producers are at the bottom of the food chain, but if you're an herbivore, what are you doing? Eating. You're eating producers. Herbivore. So, you, you're not a plant that eats itself. Okay. So check with your bio buddy. Did they miss question number one? Ask him, do you need assistance? No, May I come alongside you? you? May I help you? Easy, easy, easy. <laughs> oh my. Okay, which of the following would be a primary consumer in a vegetable garden? So primary consumer. What would be another name for primary consumer? Herbivore. So you're eating herbs. Okay, you're herbivoring it. So this one, 22 of you got this. A if it's sucking on sap, sap from a cucumber leaf. But E, all of these are correct. So let's talk about these. Lady bu um, beetle eating an aphid. An aphid would probably be an, what? Herbivore, right? And so what kind of aphid would, that would be a primary consumer. Then the lady beetle would be the secondary, secondary consumer. And then in C, a songbird now eating the lady beetles, that would be a tertiary, tertiary consumer. And a fox eating the songbird would now be a... Quaternary. Yeah, so definitely not the first one. So check your bio, buddy, because four of you at least struggled on that. Say, did you do okay? Can I help you? They don't show, they don't know. Not it. Could um, you please differentiate, whoever's not it, pass or plate, on decomposers, producers, and consumers? Go. Oh, wonderful. Thank you very much. What do you mean, maybe? Give me the tentative answer. No, like, I'm going for it, but then sometimes I'm like, Okay, whoever, um, hang on. So, oh, did I restart it? I can't even remember. Is time passing? Yes, it is. Okay, so it all starts with the sun. And whoever just explained, whoever you are, I'm going to call you the A person, whoever just finished explaining. B person, could you please review um, the first two laws of thermodynamics? Go ahead. Okay, A person, can you apply the first two laws of thermodynamics to this diagram right here? Go. Okay, come back to me. It says energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only change form. So, where does all of our energy come from? Who is the ultimate source of all of our energy? The sun. The big yellow one's the sun. So, ultimately, all of our energy comes from there. The second law says when it changes forms, you'll lose some as heat. So as you're moving that through, and keep this in mind, take your hand, mimic me. These are two big things you have to remove, remember from this, is energy flows, 
Say it. Energy, energy flows, flows, nutrient cycle. Nutrient cycle. Go again. Energy, energy flows and nutrient, nutrient cycle. cycle. And as the energy flows, what's happening every time it flows? Losing can it. you do that? I don't think I can. <laughs> Why am I doing the pointy hand? I know. What is this? I'm trying. I'm Go trying. Or is like, I'm trying. I'm trying to help. What is this? Why would I do this? Losing. Every time it's flowing, right, we have less and less and less of it because we're losing some of its heat each time it changes, right? Um, when we say nutrient cycle, what are the four cycles I'm going to want you to know? Nitrogen, carbon, water, phosphorus. If they're going to ask you a question, I bet it's on nitrogen or phosphorus cycle, but we'll talk about all of them. The carbon cycle you know really well already because you know the dynamics of cellular respiration versus photosynthesis, right? And then in all these cycles, the other thing we're going to discuss today is how man screws them up. All right, that's pretty much it. <laughs> All right, so now let's take a look at this. I had you just learn something. Is it B person's turn? Yeah. B, explain what I just had you learn about energy and nutrients in this diagram. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. So the energy is represented in orange. The energy is flowing through the system. It's originating at the sun. You're losing some at each level. Okay. And then you can see the nutrients are cycling. Now, how they how they might cycle is here in a food chain. I know this looks like an orange. But it's not. What is it supposed to be? Sun. The sun. Let's identify. So here's the sun's energy. What could we call this thing right here? A producer. What else? Autotroph. An autotroph. Good. Give me another name. Plants. Give me another name. Oh, it does look monocotic. Yes, I agree. Go. Boom shakalaga. A pho photo autotroph. Okay. That would all work. Okay. What about this? Yeah, the cricket would be a, wait, 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 a primary what? Consumer. Okay, what else would you call it? Herbivore. Any other names? Looking for an H word. Heterotroph. Good. Okay, then what about the frog? What can we call it? Secondary consumer. Heterotroph. Carnivore. Okay. And how would the snake's description be different than the frog's description? Tertiary. Tertiary consumer. Okay. What do you think we have more of, frogs or snakes? Frogs. frogs. Support that, um, A person. Support that. Why more frogs than snakes? Go ahead. <laughs> So, why more frogs than snakes? If you had more snakes, you wouldn't have enough frogs, so they would probably then what? Die. So you've got to, at each level, you're generally the numbers are going to be larger, but that doesn't always work. Um, usually biomass is larger, but even that doesn't always work. What always works when you stack them, there'll be few, is energy. There's always more energy on the level below, okay? And you're always, because you're always losing energy each time it changes form. So what we're looking at right here is a food chain, a single path of energy flow. But that's not very realistic, right? Because there are other things that eat frogs besides um, snakes, right? So we want to look at a food web where you can see the interaction and all the possible feeding relationships. And I want you to pay attention to the arrows. Okay, look where the arrows go. And think of the arrows as like mouths. Oh, I just, I wish I was a different color. Okay, 
So think of those, so when this lady beetle or whatever, that's not a lady beetle, that's some other beetle, it's going into the mouth of the uh, mouse, right? You see that? That's important to know which way the, what the labels are going. I want you to look at this caterpillar. If some pest came along and killed out the caterpillar, who would be directly impacted by the loss of our caterpillar? Mouse, I agree with you. Who else? The, bird. the birds. Anybody else? The beetle. The beetle. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Okay, so primarily because all of them feed on them, right? But you probably know the end of the story, right? Because if the bird has less worm, um, caterpillar to eat, then he's probably going to prey more on the grasshoppers and the lady beetles, so their numbers are probably gonna go down as well, yes? Okay, so this is what you need to be aware of whenever you look at a food web. It's usually more complicated. Just the removal of one doesn't affect just the immediate around it. It has a ripple effect throughout your ecosystem. Yes? Could you also say that the plant is directly positively affected? Well, you're absolutely right. If this plant number goes up, right, because he's not getting eaten, then what else could go up? Right, this, this number could go up, right? And so then what else is that gonna influence? Is that gonna influence the mouse population? Exactly. And so this is a fairly simple food web. It's more complicated, probably looks like something like this, okay? And before I go on any, mar any more about food webs, um, not it. Oh my gosh. So whoever is not it, Pass or play, I've given you all the notes on food webs. Take the lead on that and go ahead and talk about it. So okay, if one thing happens at, 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 like, at the, like, the base level, like, especially at like, the producer level or at like, the primary consumer level, it cuts off all the energy so everything back to the all right, and of course we need to talk about it from what happens when man steps in because a lot of times we don't appreciate all the interconnectedness and what can end up happening and we could be trying to do a good deed which turns into a bad deed. I'm going to read you a quick little story time. Um, okay. This is our old AP bio book, but there's a story in here I really like, so I'm going to read it to you. Efforts to eliminate undesirable species from a community often reveal hidden linkages to other organisms and many dramatically demonstrate the complex interactions on which community stability rests. I can see AP questions like this, can't you? When they talk, they assume, or they'll give you the information on community stability and they'll say, what happens if this occurs? What happens if this occurs? Could you predict what would happen next? Um, an unintended cautionary example was provided by the World Health Organization, and the acronym for that is WHO, W-H-O in a campaign to eradicate uh, malaria-carrying mosquitoes in the Borneo states of Malaysia, where as many as 90% of the population of some areas suffered from the disease. Mosquito control was achieved by spraying the, the insides of the village huts with DDT and Deldrin, two powerful contact insecticides, and malaria was indeed eradicated. So you'd go, yay, we got rid of malaria. But soon the villagers began to notice that the thatch roofs of their huts were rotting and beginning to collapse. Investigations showed that the deterioration which occurred only in the hut sprayed with DDT was inflicted by the larva of a moth that normally lives in small numbers in the thatch roof. Whereas the thatch eating moth larva avoided food sprayed with DDT, the moth's natural enemy, a parasitic wasp, was very sensitive to it. The net result was a substantial increase in the population of larvae eating the thatch. The collapse of thousands of roofs would have been tragedy enough, but there was yet another side effect, um, potentially more serious. Cockroaches and a small house lizard, the gecko, are two normal inhabitants of the village hut. DDT-contaminated cockroaches were eaten by the geckos, which were in turn eaten by house cats as were some cockroaches. The cats, poisoned by the accumulation of the insecticide, died. What ensued was a population explosion of rats, which are potential carriers of such diseases as leptoporosis, typhus, and the plague. 
So now, not only are their homes collapsing around them, but now they have rats, their cats are dead, rats are everywhere, and they're worried about the plague. In an attempt to restore the cat population, World Health Organization and the Royal Air Force undertook a remarkable venture called Operation Cat Drop, <laughs> in which they parachuted cats into the villages. <laughs> With the cat population restored, the rats and the consequent threat of serious diseases subsided. So I want to tell you that sometimes we don't always see all the consequences of our behavior where we think we're doing a good thing, we end up causing all this devastation. We don't see the ripple effect of that. Now, if you look here, um, as you were discussing with your bio buddy, there was a grazing food um, versus if you're dealing with detritus. So grazing, grazing, those are things that are eating what? Plants. And most of your food webs are going, you know, you're gonna have a lot of food webs, obviously starting with plant materials. And again, do you see this pattern with numbers? Did they draw this pyramid accurately, do you think? Um, uh, Slate, explain. Is this pyramid accurately drawn? Why or why not? I had you do an Ed puzzle on this. There's a percentage I want you to be thinking about. We'll do it later at the end or something. Do you remember how much gets passed on to each level? What is it? 10%. So this one right here, you would expect this one to be 10% of what's here at the bottom. So these pyramids should have drastic fall off, right? And that's why you end at maybe four feeding levels because you keep running out of nutritional value as you're moving up. Okay, so here's a grazing food web. Here's one uh, detrital food chain starting with, like this could be the guano at the bottom of a bat cave, okay? And that's where it's starting. So this is not starting, it's actually starting with um, um, like urine or feces or dead um, animals and it's starting with heterotrophs feeding on that and then, or decomposers feeding on that and then other heterotrophs consuming them. So there are food chains that don't start with a photoautotroph. Um, and I think you have that all in your notes, yes? All right, and then the two can cross over um, and could Blue explain how that could occur? How could these two different food webs cross over? So you could have something eat a worm, but also eat seeds or fruit as well, right? Then they're in both the detritus and in the plant material. So those can overlap for sure. Now, if you line these up, okay, and like I said, only 10% gets passed on. If you line these up, grass goes to the grasshopper, goes to the snake, goes to the goes to the hawk, if you, you can call those different trophic levels. And so plant material sits at the first trophic level. And then a grasshopper, an herbivore, is eating it, that is at the second trophic level because all of your primary consumers would be at the second trophic level. And then so on as you work your way up. Tell your bio buddy what you had for dinner last night and identify what trophic level you ate at. So I'm guessing most of you eat at what levels? First and second. Unless any of you had shark last night, or snake, or you eat hawk, I don't know. Um, most of us eat about the first and second um, trophic levels. And in this particular food web, when you see Roman numerals like that, those are the trophic levels that they're sitting at. Okay. Um, on your notes, do I owe you anything on that? I don't think. Oh yeah, so the only thing you have to do, and we're not actually there yet on that part, so here are a couple questions. Let's get some hundies so you don't need to ask for assistance.
So which organisms are consumers? Everything except the autotrophs, right? So a couple of you missed that. By the way, if you clicked on the picture, it identifies them as producers and consumers. Um, so see if your bio buddy finished that first one. Were they part of the 24 or not? Ask him, do you need assistance? May I help you? I know. Oh, the struggle is real. So who is at the first trophic level? The flower. Who is the second trophic level? The caterpillar. Who is the third one? The frog. Okay, only 19 of you got that right. Got that right. Check with your bio buddy. Were you one of the 19? Or can I assist you? Plus, I think it actually identified it again. Yeah. No. What do you mean all carnivores? Oh, okay, here, let me go back, help you. Okay, so the first trophic level are gonna be your producers. The second trophic levels are your primary consumers. Right, heterotroph. Your third trophic level would be your secondary consumer, and that's how it works its way. So in this picture, uh, the plant would be at the, the flower would be at the first trophic level, then a caterpillar was eating the flower, and so that would be at the second trophic level. And then at the third trophic level was the frog who ate the caterpillar. Is that right? Frog who ate the caterpillar. Okay. And then to the fifth trophic Then the fourth one, the fourth trophic level, snake. who ate the frog? The snake would be at the fourth. And then owl. Uh, owl. owl would be at the fifth trophic level. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah. check your bio buddy, see if they're okay with that. Any problemos? Wait, Miss Lynn, I have a quick question. Yes, by all means. So these. let's say I ate the owl, would I be the sixth? Yes. <laughs> you are the only sixth. I'm just going to call you sixth from now on. So wait, if I eat Max, no longer Max, you're sixth. Isn't that crazy? Sixth, the owl eater. Um, could I have Slate explain this, please? Go ahead, Slate. No problem. <laughs> Now, let me ask you this. Is the owl always at, would you say owl must be at the fifth trophic level? No. no, it was at the fifth trophic level in our particular food chain. Right? Because if it's eating a mouse who's eating seeds, it's at the third trophic level. In this particular food chain, it was there. So you need to look at their diet and what they generally eat. Yes? You can also have like multiple animals at the same trophic level. Yeah. Well, it just, it's that particular food chain. You're just asking where is it in the, in the okay. trophic level, yeah. Okay, so now um, we're gonna take these trophic levels and stack them on top of each other, and these are your ecological pyramid. And this, an ecological pyramid is just a model, right? One of our science practices is using models. So this is just a model to represent those eating levels. And to make this model more accurate, we would need to have each layer of the pyramid go down and become smaller because only 10% fall, falls into that. Also, a problem with this model is there's no place to put decomposers. Okay, no place, because where are decomposers on this? Because decomposers decompose here, here, and here. So I'm just re-reminding you of your science practices and that you could take something that is modeling some phenomena in science and you could analyze it and say what is it, how does this model work and how does this model not work? Do you understand if I ask that as a question or that they, that would make sure you understood ecosystems better if you could say well this is a good model except it doesn't allow for decomposers. That shows you really understand an ecosystem. This is a good model except you need to draw it in this way. That could be something where they would say draw this model where it would be more appropriate, where it would reflect better what it's trying to model, and you would draw it with the pyramid getting smaller. You would add in decomposers at each level, okay? So um, why only 10% getting passed on? Could um, Dark Shirt One explain using this diagram? So, 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 
So you've had a lot of meals in your lifetime. I've had a lot of meals. Do you remember some of your best meals? Yeah. Okay. Now, are all of your meals represented in your body? No. <laughs> Why? Because you were trying to maintain homeostasis. In order to maintain homeostasis, what reaction did you need to do? Cellular respiration, which burned the fuel that went into your body, right? And you did that to generate what? <laughs> ATP. And with that ATP, you might have built muscle, right? You might have built fat. Um, <laughs> he didn't even look up when he said it, so I'll just, I'll, I'll look it up. Okay, so there's a lot of things you're, you're building, but then the rest of it, that ATP was used to move around. That requires energy, right? Moving around, thinking, processing, any of your reactions to maintain homeostasis. So really only about 10% gets passed on to that next level. Sometimes a little more, sometimes a little bit less. If I was going to apply this to plants, I might talk about gross primary productivity versus net primary producti productivity. And how would I calculate that? I'd take gross primary productivity minus the process of, all cells do it, cellular, cellular respiration. respiration. That will give me net primary productivity for a plant, right? Now, does a plant do more photosynthesis or more cellular respiration, or do they do the same amount? And I know this because you are alive. Because <laughs> a byproduct of photosynthesis is oxygen. If they did photosynthesis and cellular respiration at the same rate, then they would only make enough oxygen for their needs in cellular respiration. But you are, in fact, alive. So they must do more photosynthesis than cellular respiration. Yeah? Okay, because you have the oxygen and you have nutrients that you harvest from plants. So you represent this in these ecological pyramids. And there are several different ways. You can do it just purely based on numbers. So there's more blades of grass than there are bugs who are eating the blades of grass. And there are more bugs eating the grass number numerically than there are birds eating the bugs or whatever, right? But that does not always hold true because you could have one tree that supports millions of insects, right? So you can't always represent it by numbers. So you might um, represent it per um, mass if you just weighed every level. The tree weighs more than all the insects, right, mass-wise. But even that doesn't always hold true when you do that um, because sometimes you'll have a small amount of algae. And what did we say algae or plants can do? More photosynthesis than cellular respiration. So you could have plants supporting more organisms um, than um, mass-wise. They could be a smaller mass than the organisms they support. The only real ecological pyramid that holds is the pyramid of energy because if I measure the amount of energy, there's more energy produced at this bottom level than the next level. So I would asterisk or highlight the, um, the one where I said the pyramid of energy. And what number did you put under the basics? 10%. 10%. All right.
Okay, now hear me. I have been assigning independent reviews, right? I think like eight of them. Could you review without me assigning it? Yeah. You could. So when I see things like gene expression, um, cladograms, tropism, immune system, okay, uh, gibberellin, cellular respiration, <laughs> photo, you don't need to review it, Rob, you're not. Um, meiosis. Where could be some quick reviews that you could do? You could use the back of the book. What else could you use? Summaries at the bottom. Summaries at the bottom of the notes. What else could you use? Bozeman's are somewhere between five to fifteen minutes generally. Crash course. Those are a little bit longer. You could watch if you really need some, you know, serious help and you want to rewatch a whole lecture. All of the lectures are posted online. You go watch snippets of it on the areas that you need. So if there are areas that you have identified as a weak link for you, okay, foraging theory, go spend your time where it's going to give you the maximum benefit. Go review those areas. And the sooner you start independently, and I know some of you started, you know, winter break you started reviewing. Some of you only do it if you have to. Some of you don't do it authentically, even when I give you those reviews. You're using somebody else's answers, okay? The, so <laughs> the sooner you start independently and focusing on the things that you need, the better off you're going to be. When you took the AP exam, for those of you that were here on Sunday, did you find some questions where you went, dang it, I should have read that question better. I would have got it right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. right? So I'm going to tell you, make those mistakes now in your practice review. Okay, make those mistakes now when it doesn't count for anything so you don't make it on the real exam in less than two weeks. And for those of you who weren't able to come on Sunday, one I would say would be a good classic one was that blood types one and the Hardy-Weinberg, right? Yeah. And I told you, when I looked at that question and we're doing P plus Q plus R in this case, I'm like, oh my gosh, my students aren't gonna be able to do this. No, 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 and I'm frustrated and I'm trying to work it all out and I'm like mad internally as I'm taking it. Did I need to get mad internally? No, because if I would have actually read the question, I would have said all I needed to do is take the square root, right? So it was so much simpler, but I made more of it than I needed to. That's wasting your energy, right? You want to look at these questions and go, okay, what do you really want? What are you really asking? And those diagrams, right? Sometimes they get this huge big diagram and there's something in there like that CRE gene one or whatever and you're like, yeah. you, you, they ask the simplest question over it five questions later, you know? And you're like, Ugh. okay? So remember, practice doing those things, like taking those, that's why I'm flipping one more exam in. Did you see that? I'm gonna do one more practice exam on that Friday. Mm -hmm. So we can do the multiple choice part of it. So you get more exposure to that, okay? So yes? There are. Yeah. So what happens is when they give these tests before they release them, some of them they're gonna keep private because they may wanna reuse them, or sometimes it might be a poor question. Like I can go through, and I'm happy to share it with you, I can tell you, oh, question 13, only 32% of the kids got that one right. But 87% of the kids got this one right. You know, So you can go back and through. So if it's written in a way that's really poor, they might not even put it in the one when they release it or they may want to keep it so they can reuse it in another exam. Yes? So the, if there are 69 questions... Then you have less time than what you had experienced on that day. Yes. Yeah. Now, I'm going to tell you this as well. So you need to think about that, right? What did I tell you from the very beginning? That this exam favors those that can what? Read, Read quickly and understand. Now, here's some advantage you're going to have that you haven't had with me you're going to be able to what? Write on. on the test. I don't know about you, but that helps me a lot. Because as I'm reading, I'd be circling keywords, circling data, underlining things. Also, you're gonna get worn out tired. And so by having activity you have to do to interact, that increases your engagement. That's why I don't just give you all of the notes. I make you have to at least type something in or find a picture, because otherwise you're gonna go off in la la land. 
So if you are circling during your exam time, circling, highlighting as you go through, write on their booklets wherever you want to, that's gonna help you stay engaged. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you as well that I'll have kids take practice exams and they'll say, oh, I got a da-da-da. Well, now those exams are released and their scores are released to me. The number of fours and fives on some of those practice exams you took are not equivalent to the actual number of fours and fives. fives. The realized niche versus the fundamental niche are two totally different things on that. And why is that? Because you have teachers that have taught for many years who are going to spend a week just minimally learning how to grade so they grade every AP exam the same on the essays. Okay? You're coming in looking at a key and trying to go, okay, I guess that would count for a point or that won't count for a point. And you know you're writing, so you know what you said there. You didn't flush it out. You saw all those ones where they said, make a statement, now support it. Some of you didn't support, but you'd give yourself a point for it anyway, because in your mind, you really know how to do that. So you'd probably get that point. That doesn't mean you would actually do that on the exam. That's why I say, I want you to look at those keys and see how do they grade it, and that's how you need to write. You need to write supporting with evidence. Okay? Yeah? Yeah, you can see where the curve is. And I'm going to tell you, since the exam has been changed, that curve, it's like narrowed. It's like, what is it called when you select against either extreme? Stable. They've done some stabilizing selection. And the three numbers are a lot higher, but the ones and the fives are a lot fewer. So you can actually get them in the Well, like, for instance, if you if you missed a I don't even know what the, what, the, what the breakdown is. I missed two when I took the multiple choice. I missed two on the multiple choice. <laughs> what? <laughs> It'd be interesting to see if we missed the same two. One of them, it was just stupid. I was moving too quickly. And one I would say was a ser it was an error. I made a mistake. When I, I didn't look at it pro appropriately, it was, it's a true mistake on my part. But I would still get a three just based on the multiple choice, right? So. A lot of you, if you score really well on that multiple choice, you already have your three locked in based on the curve. But we are not shooting for threes. You want that five. You want that five. You go for that five. You make effort for the five. Yeah. Okay. Um, in, in the essay question? Yes. The score still like four bullet points? Yes, but it was only worth one point. Right. So when they, they max out, so there might be five ways for you to support or state that, five different examples you could pick from, but they're only giving you one point for that. So and they're not usually giving you one point if you just say that. You have to say it with support, right? So th they're giving you ways to do that. So if some of you are going, oh, I'm giving myself four points for that, all of a sudden a 10 point question all of a sudden became a 15 point question for you. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't make up, one area can't make up for another area. Do they give you that one point only if you include all of them? No, 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 you just had to come up with one. If they say, give one reason why oh, okay. you would have picked this for your control, yeah. then you only have to come up with one reason why you would have picked for your oh, control. Okay. Yeah. Okay? Yes? When you said they narrowed down the curve for the ones and fives. Yeah. When was that? Was it just last year for this one? No, 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 it was like three years ago. This will be probably the fourth year, I think, on that. Since the exam's been changed. And the curve that was on our practice exam last That's time. the accurate, that's the curve they used. Okay. Yeah, I gave you the grading sheet they used. Yeah. It would have been, if it was a different exam, it would have a different grading sheet. Yes. So you take points off if you don't write in paragraph form? Yes. They might not grade it. So just write in paragraph form. Is that going to take more time? Yes. Okay. So you cannot dilly dally at any point. There is just literally no dilly dallying. Yes? So can we not be like 1A, 1B, it just has to be 1? No, 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 no. If they ask you to answer, you better make sure that you answer it in the format they ask. So if they say question 1A, you want to write 1A. Meh, 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 meh. 1B. Meh, 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 meh. Don't blend it all together. Don't make them try to figure out because they won't know if you, they'll just apply everything to 1A probably and then they're done. They won't read your B and C because you didn't differentiate. Right? 
Okay. Yes. Um, for the essays, will they take off points for stuff that's incorrect? If you counter, counter, if you what, contradict okay. something you said. You know, if you say it says one thing and then you say it says another thing that's opposite, they're going to go, oh, yeah. And if you use something for support that's wrong, then you won't get the support points, right? Yes. Once the college board releases the FAQs, will we ever like go over them in class? Because the, you'll you'll they'll be released the moment you take them, yeah. literally. So we can talk about them in class, but I won't have they won't have developed yeah. the key yet, so I won't know. But we can talk about them for sure. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? All right. Let's check this. All right. Uh oh. Somebody picked C. Why are we not picking C? Because it's grazing. It's grazing. A fungus is a what? Decomposer, right? So, so you're you're starting with detritus, and so that's not going to be a grazing food chain. Check your bio, buddy. See, did they get it right? Do you need help? Do you need assistance? Okay, everybody. I think this is somebody who logged in twice, so we're good on that one. Uh oh. So, here we go. So that's some what? Grass. Grass. Okay, uh, here. consumers. Somebody put tertiary consumers and that would be this guy. <laughs> okay. He has a giant snake. Thing with, yeah. Okay. Check with your bio buddy. Do you understand clarifying questions? So we know, what did we say? Energy what? Flows. flows. Energy flows and nutrients cycle. So we want to talk about the biogeochemical cycles, not it. Pass or play on differentiating between these three words. Go. All right, so let me give you an example. Nitrogen, um, nitrogen, the reservoir for that is the atmosphere, it's N2, and 78, breathe in, 78% of what you were just exhaling, breathing in was nitrogen gas. It did not make your muscles any bigger. Plants can't use it either. To get it to where living things can access it, it's got to be in the exchange pool. So for the um, plants to access it, they need bacteria to do nitrogen fixation. Nitrogen fixing bacteria will do that, where they'll take nitrogen from the air and get it into ammonia NH3 or ammonium NH4. And then you've got to get it converted to nitrite and then usually nitrate before plants can access it. Now it's in the exchange pool. Once it's in a plant, it's in the what? Community. Then an animal can eat the plant, it's still in the community. Decomposers might work on dead plants and dead animals. It'll get decomposed back into ammonium, and it's still in the exchange pool. 
If that nitrogen get re gets returned to the atmosphere, then it's back into the reservoir again. Okay, so could I please have whoever did those terms refine their explanation based on what I just told you? Go. Okay, and whoever explained this, other bio buddy, this is on you. Go. Um, NGSS when you're going to take that next year or you take your SAT2 which you're going to take in biology yes, yes. You signed up for that and when you take your AP exam always make this assumption man is bad I'm not saying man is bad but I'm telling you that's the approach you want to take because that is the climate in which we live man is bad and ruining everything now is man ruining a lot of things yes okay I'm not saying that I like actually living, so I want to continue to live on the planet. And every day is Earth Day, okay? But what I want you to do is usually man can step in, and when man does, generally speaking, we tend to screw things up. Okay? So, and we'll be talking through that in our last chapter. So, for instance, in the water cycle, how do we tend to screw up the water cycle? Why we pollute it. We pollute the water cycle. And the problem is when we talk about the water cycle, which I know you're all familiar with, is how much of the water on this planet is fresh water? 3%. And most, so of all the water on the earth, 3% is fresh water, which is what we need. And most of that 3% is locked up in what? Glaciers. Okay, that's what I say, invest in water, okay? Because water is a tremendous commodity. And so when you look at the water cycle, which is here, and blue, I shouldn't have to tell you anything about the general workings of the water cycle. Blue will take care of it using this diagram. Go ahead. Stop. Explain. Listen to me. Don't blow this off. You got a test in less than two weeks. Not only should you talk about this water cycle, but you should be thinking while you're explaining what things can impact the water cycle or what things does the water cycle impact. Go ahead. Keep going. Yeah, so From the ocean goes it's the still there. It's still there. It's still there. Yeah, and so you've got a mixture between glaciers melting, right, and water evaporating. You've got that, and let's, we're going to come back to that, actually. I'm going to revisit that. Okay, what are some things man does? We pollute it. When you say you're out of water at your house, that means you're out of what? Bottled water for you to throw in a backpack. Okay, for those of you who still have the bottled water. I did for years. I've only recently given that up in the last two or three years. Um, and some of you are still buying the bottled water. I buy it when I go somewhere and I want something to drink and I don't have water. I buy bottled water. But pe there are many people on our planet, when they say they're out of water, they literally mean they are out of water. Or they have to hike 10 miles to get that water. And I hope to God he's going to boil that before he drinks it, right? Okay, from all the parasites that are there. And we do contaminate waterways, okay? And everything's going to end up in water because as it rains, everything gets washed in, right? Drains. They talk about watching the drains that you have as well. Um, and then a big issue is groundwater mining. Last year when you were in foundations, you learned about that when you talked about the water cycle and you talked about your irrigation challenge. 
because you were trying to make your beans grow, right? And so you, you wanted to spend the least amount of money for the highest productivity of your plant. And during those discussions, you probably watched a video where you know from like Oxnard to San Jose is like the salad bowl of the United States, right, as far as farming goes. And where are they getting a lot of their water if it's not coming from Northern California out of their lakes, which pisses them off, okay? Where are we getting our water from? The ground. The ground. Now, if you have an above ground well and you can see how much water you can go, oh, we have this much water, we have this much water, we better conserve. Can we know what's underground? No. no. And we see consequences of us taking too much water out of the ground because then the ground starts to what? Fall. Yeah, it falls. What do we call that? Sinkholes. Yeah. And so to me that is terrifying because at some point they keep having to drill deeper and deeper and deeper to get at the same water and some of the water tables they're touching are contaminated by sulfur that you can't use or make people sick because of pollution that is making its way down through the soil. So to me, this cycle is one that you should have heavy concern for here in California because our source of water, we have great climate for growing things, but we may not have the water resource we need to continue to do that. All right, so that's your water cycle. We've already done that. So now let's move on to the carbon and oxygen cycle. And um, slate, you're going to take care of that, especially if you look here, pay attention to the things that contribute in different ways and how they contribute to your carbon and your oxygen. Go ahead. So, which things on, of your four items here, which things decrease the amount of CO2 in the air? Only photosynthesis. Who does photosynthesis? Plants. What are we doing to plants? Killing them, cutting them down, right? Large plants like trees, cutting them down, okay? So now, if we have more CO2 in the air, because it's not natural systems because of three, right? Three happens only rarely, right? When you have lightning strikes in forests or something. Normally, combustion is happening because of man. And man is? Uh, right. So we're doing a lot of combustion. <laughs> See, you got that answer right. We're doing a lot of combustion, which increases the amount of CO2. So what's wrong with having too much CO2? The light comes in. Hits the earth, comes back to leave, but it can't, right? And bounces, re-radiates back down on earth. So what does that do to our global mean temperature? Increases. Increases. Why is that bad? Because those glaciers will start to no. melt. Now, what are those glaciers made out of? What kind of water? Fresh water. As those glaciers melt, they increase the amount of fresh water in the oceans, which decreases the salinity which changes the density, which changes the cycling of the water, which changes global weather patterns, which causes death. <laughs> <laughs> or in the short term, okay, I want you to think about it this way. Just little changes in temperatures. You know enzymes work at a specific temperature, temperature and pH, pH etc., right? So think about plants, which are oftentimes at the bottom of the food chain, right? Yeah. They grow at specific temperatures because they're adapted to that temperature. If that plant now has a range that's been decreased because it's not as cold in that area anymore, that temperature where it'd be cold, let's say it went down halfway down the mountain now, that cold temperature because of the increase in the global mean temperature, let's say it's only that cold um, a third of the way down. Now those plants can't outcompete other plants. There's other ones that compete better underneath that temperature. So now you have less of that plant. Well, you might have a large mammal that's dependent upon that plant. Now you're affecting this, you know, or a small herbivore, and then a large mammal in the food chain eats him, right? So you're throwing all of those off, and you're decreasing the range in which they can live. And that can lead to extinction, because remember, we looked at just one case where we removed one species, and what could happen as a result of all of that, right? 
And, and so it, it can have this domino effect and affect other species as well. So don't just go, oh, who cares? It's just one owl, okay? We don't know all the many roles that that one owl plays, right, within its habitat. So that's something you want to be concerned about. Um, when we talk about GPP, MPP, and respiration, I, this is probably, you can't see this very well, but this is estuary swamps and marshes, tropical rainforest, forest, agriculture, land, grassland, down to tundra and open ocean and deserts. Could I have whoever's turn it is to do some explaining? Talk about GPP, MPP, and R, and relate that to these different biomes. Go ahead. Make the connection. Okay, so GPP, that's talking about how many, how much sugar, right, the plant does on the whole. Okay, but not all of that sugar is for sharing because it needs to do some what? Cellular respiration. Cellular respiration is represented by what letter up there? R. So you take your gross primary productivity minus the respiration that that plant does, and you're left with net primary productivity, which can be used by other organisms, yeah? Okay, so where are you gonna have more MPP? At the top of the lake, the middle of the lake, or the bottom of the lake? Probably at the top of the lake, why? There's more sunlight, right? As you go down through the lake, it's gonna get darker and darker and darker, right? And so your, your net primary productivity is gonna go down because there's not as many plants in those areas that, that can do photosynthesis as it gets darker. Does that make sense to you? Okay. So when you look at these different biomes, here's this tropical rainforest. Well, there's two things going for it there. A lot of sunlight and a lot of rain, right? So you're gonna have really high NPP. But as we're moving through these different forests and moving you know, to lakes and streams or tundra, we have less and less. Where do we have the greatest biodiversity on this planet? Rainforest. Because you have a lot of <coughs> high MPP, that means you can support more, species. yeah, more species. You can support the consumers. Where you have greater productivity, you can support more consumers who in turn can support more secondary consumers and tertiary consumers and that's why you have the greatest variety of species, okay, in those areas. And why do you have that? Well, that's because, well, we'll talk more about Okay, so relating that to the, your um, carbon cycle, okay? And then the other thing I wanna remind you of is carbon travels in bodies of water the same way it travels in our bodies of water inside of us. How does CO2 travel in us? In our blood is how? Bicarbonate. Bicarbonate, yeah, travels is bicarbonate. Okay, so that's how you're gonna see it in your aquatic um, systems as well, because we're aquatic, right? Okay, um, why is this happening? Look at your trend, your overall trend, but also look at your fluctuations every year. Why are you getting those fluctuations every year? And then also make a claim about the trend that you're seeing discussed with BioBuddy, go. fluctuating every year and what is the overall trend? So let's do the easier of the two, right? What's your overall trend? It's increasing. It's increasing. But why does it fluctuate throughout the year? Season. Because in summer, wherever your summer or spring is, you have more sunlight so you can do more photosynthesis which will decrease the amount of CO2 and in winter it will increase the amount of CO2 because you're um, GPP is less, right? Okay, check with your bio buddy, make sure they understand that, and if not, use this to help them. Use that line to help them. Use this to help them. You're just going to go 
go first or second? I'm gonna, go, oh, yep, yep. Um, how would this differ if you were just looking at land around the equator? Probably more consistent, mm -hmm. but because most of the land is in the northern hemisphere, that's why we see that fluctuation. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so somebody's going to go first. I'm only going to give you 20 seconds to talk about the greenhouse effect and then the other bio leaves. Yeah. our global mean temperature, causing global warming. Allowing heat in, but it cannot escape, which can impact our global mean temperature, causing global warming. You know, if you still believe in that. Because <laughs> for the last hundred days, apparently we haven't. <laughs> All right, next cycle. Now, these two cycles they could ask you about, I wouldn't be surprised if they asked something related to global warming or what are the, by, you know, things like when you have more of that UV rate, if you're destroying the ozone layer, remember we've talked about that before, you could have increased cases of uh, issues with our immune system, with cancer, there's all sorts of things related around here they could ask you about. But of the two cycles, it's probably phosphorus or nitrogen they would focus their energy on. And the reservoir for phosphorus is in rocks. And usually phosphorus is a limiting factor um, in um, some sort of producer growth or algal growth. First of all, why is phosphorus important? Where do we use it? DNA, right? Base, sugar, phosphate. Why else is it important? ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Okay, so we definitely need phosphorus, right? Um, phospholipids in cell membranes, right? Okay. So phosphorus is usually a limiting agent, but the way you get it, if the re why did they draw rain right here? It's due to what? It starts with a W. Weathering. Weathering, Weathering gets it out of the um, reservoir. If man goes and digs up things and causes erosion, that's going to increase the amount of phosphorus, right? Things like um, fertilizers have a lot of phosphates in them. Soap has a lot of phosphates in them. Fecal material has a lot of phosphates in them. Those are all things that can increase the phosphorus levels in, let's say, a body of water. And it will get in the body of water, it'll get picked up by plants, plants will pass it on to animals, etc. And when you have enough nutrients in there, it can support a lot of plant life. So your MPP will be very high initially. But if you start growing, a lot of, let's say, algae in this body of water because you get a bunch of phosphates in there, okay? Eventually, you're gonna run out of the phosphates. So who's gonna work on those then? Who's gonna work on these, this algae? If you run out of phosphates, what's gonna happen to them? They're gonna what? Die. Die. So who's gonna work on them then? Who takes care of dead things for us on our planet? Oh, decomposers. Okay. Do decomposers do photosynthesis or cellular respiration? Decomposers. What do they do? Oh, they do cellular. They do cellular respiration. What gas are they going to require? Oxygen. So now the decomposers who are eating all that dead algae are now gonna take all the oxygen out of the lake and what can, that, what can that happen to the lake then? It can die. 
Yeah, and at first you go, oh, good, nutrient enrichment. We got these phosphates in here, more algae, but the algae dies. Decomposers work on them. Decomposers do cellular respiration, not photosynthesis. Whatever benefit you got from that oxygen is now depleted and can end up killing off that lake due to over-enrichment. So um, these are all the things. If you look right here, discharge from different um, sewage treatment, discharge from detergents, natural runoff. Has anybody ever gone up, uh, driven up Highway 5 and like, I think it's past Bakersfield, going up north on Highway 5, there's like Harris Ranch and they're all the cattle. Have you ever? Oh, yeah. So you can oh, smell it for yes. miles. So cool. What are you smelling? Fecal material, right? Or the bacteria that are working on the fecal material, right? Okay, so that's what you're smelling. If there's a heavy rain, all of that waste is going to be put into what? The waterways causing over enrichment, which can ultimately lead to death of the neighboring waterway. Got it? So it's not natural to have that many cattle contained in one area where they're only pooping in one area because they don't want the poop everywhere. They're raking it up or however they're getting it, right? And so those kind of runoff from those areas can cause a lot of problems. So here you can see a lake before and after it had an algal bloom. So during this algal bloom, eventually that can end up killing the lake because all those plants die and decomposers remove the oxygen. Yes? If there's like a lack of phosphorus, will it like instantly turn to normal? Do you think it'll be like sticky? Yeah, it might take a while, but then here's the thing. Unless you are subsidizing this lake with other creatures, once they're dead, if there's no inlet to it other than runoff, you might not, you know, if there's not a river feeding it, you may not have resources to whatever's already gone extinct or when the numbers get depleted so when like fish that are breeding if the numbers get depleted so much they even though the numbers are still in existence the density is so low they can't find each other to what mate so it's just eventually it's gonna wipe them out okay um got it you're so enthusiastic Whoever is not it, pass or play on explaining your uh, phosphorus cycle. You have a choice here. Go. Put it in your own words. I yell. All right, take a big breath in. Big breath in, here we go. What did you mostly breathe in? What gas? Could you use it? No, neither can plants. Let's talk about how that happens. This is the most complicated, but I'm going to teach you something you'll know it forever. Okay? So if we look at this, this is the simplest. This is like sixth grade nitrogen cycle. Okay? The reservoir for nitrogen is in the atmosphere. Nitro nitrogen fixing bacteria, okay? Fix it so it can be used by plants. Well, when they fix it, what's not shown here is at first it's ammonium, then it's nitrite, then it's nitrate, and then it's probably used by the plants. Then animals can eat the plants. Okay? Who can work on these plants and animals if they die? Decomposers. And decomposers put it back to what they're not showing you here, ammonia. Okay? Also, you have denitrifying bacteria that will take it from what's called nitrate and put it back into the atmosphere. This whole process uses multiple bacteria to get it from here to here. So let me bring it up one notch. Take a look here. So nitrogen-fixing bacteria, what they're going to do is they're going to take nitrogen from the air, and they're going to convert it into something like um, ammonia, NH4. Now, they could be in little nodules of legumes. That sounds like a what kind of relationship? Symbiotic relationship, what kind? Mutualism, right? Because what are the bacteria going to get? Some food from the plants. And what are the plants going to get? Nitrogen, right? Okay, or this bacteria could just be in the soil. Then this ammonium, through the process of nitrification, nitrifying bacteria, they're going to convert it first to nitrite, NO2 minus. Take the ammonium, get it to nitrite. 
Other nitrifying bacteria are going to convert it to nitrate. Plants can use nitrates. And then animals can eat those plants. Decomposers work on dead in, um, plants and animals and get it back into ammonium again, and it's staying within the community. Also, denitrifying bacteria can take your nitrates and put it back into the atmosphere. But there's something else missing from here as well. Lightning can fix nitrogen directly from N2 to nitrate. Okay? Now that's a lot, but I'm going to teach it to you right now. Two hands. Two hands. Two hands. Everybody sit up, sit up, and give me your two hands. Okay. <laughs> so go grab the nitrogen, okay? And we're going to do nitrogen fixation. Now what are we doing here? We're scrubbing. Why? What are we scrubbing with? Ammonia. Okay. All right? So go again. Go. Nitrogen fixation. And nitrogen fixing bacteria. Say it. Nitrogen fixing bacteria. Take the nitrogen gas and convert it to ammonia. Then you're going to do nitrification. Okay, and nitrifying bacteria do that. First, first, you're going to form nitrite. See how this kind of looks like an eye? So you can remember nitrite. First, nitrite. Then other nitrifying bacteria convert the nitrite to nitrate. What am I holding? Tray. Who am I going to serve this nitrate up to? I'm going to serve it to plants. We have plants. Okay, and then animals can eat the plants. Okay, just that much. Here we go. We're going to do nitrogen fixation, forming ammonia using nitrogen fixing bacteria, and they converted it from N2 to NH3. Good, or NH4. Then we're going to do nitrification with nitrifying bacteria, first forming nitrite. And then nitrate. Who are we going to serve this up to? Plants. And then animals can eat the plants. Then the plants and the animals die. Who works on these dead plants and animals? Decomposers break them back down into ammonia. Okay? Do that again. Decomposers break it back down into ammonia. Keep going. So we're just keeping it in the community, right? Now, there's another way to get here. You can do... This is nitrogen fixation, but we're using lightning. Okay? Now, however you got here, either by... Or, okay, or a factory put it in here, okay? <laughs> due to fertilizers. However you got here, you can do denitrification. Do it. Denitrification and put it back in the atmosphere, and you use denitrifying bacteria. Good. See, you know the whole thing. Now do it without me. Here we're going to do nitrogen fixation. We're converting N2 into NH3. And what is what are we using to do that? Nitrogen fixing bacteria. Then we're going to do nitrification by who? Nitrifying bacteria first. Nitrate. Who are we going to serve this to? Plants. plants. And then can eat the plants. plants. Okay. And the plants and the animals can die. Who works on them? Back into ammonium. Nitrate. What is that? Lightning. Lightning doing atmospheric, right? Okay. And then we can also do nitrification and put it back out into the reservoir. Got it down? Part of cycle. You got it cool. Okay? So, if you look at your nitrogen, yes. Goes from N2 to NO3 minus nitrate. Yeah. Do you see um, how I wrote that all down for you? Okay. Now, if you look here, here's your atmospheric fixation. Okay. Blue, take it. I got this from a fuel company website. Talk about, uh, make sure you understand it. Follow the arrows. Go ahead. 
Do you understand their symbols up here? Probably this is what? Lightning. Lightning. Yeah. And then... Is that Plants? No, I don't know. Yeah, it looks like a snowflake. And you can see here about nitrogen fixing in the roots, so hopefully you understand that. And what did I tell you about man? Man is? Yeah. All right, look what man is doing. Oh. Putting nitrous oxides up into the atmosphere, and then the rain comes down, and it turns into what? Acid rain. Acid rain is bad. Okay, It destroys plant life. It changes the pH of the soil. It displaces things like calcium so that it gets lost in runoff so you don't have other important minerals that you need. So underneath human activities, production of nitrous oxides, bad. Through fertilizers and burning of fossil fuels contributes to acid rain, photochemical smog, acid rain, photochemical smog. That smog can lead to thermal inversions. And that can lead to some questions. And there are something like nine of them here, and I would like you to get 100%. I, go, 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 because there are some other things I want to show you today. Keep going. Somebody said Miss Litton. Yes, my dear? Okay, let's go over. Last moment, last questions. Okay, see how you done? That is great sadness. What are aquifers? Underground water, right? Water tables are aquifers. So they would be a component of the water cycle. Okay. Photosynthesis is not a part of the water cycle. Do plants need water? Yes. Do animals need water? No. Do you consider us as part of that normal rotation? No. Okay. Um, sedimentary. You said nitrogen. What is the reservoir for nitrogen? Atmosphere. Okay. But most of you got phosphorus because we said the way you get it out is through what? How do we get it out of the reservoir? Weathering. Weathering. Yay. Mm. Krishna. <laughs> Nitrate to nitrogen gas is denitrification. Oh. Oh. Take a look at this because a bunch of you, only five of you got it right. Were you one of the five? Do you need assistance? Nitrogen gas, nitrogen gas to nitrate. Nitrogen gas directly, who does that? And what is that called? Nitrogen fixation. It's still nitrogen fixation, but you're bypassing ammonium and nitrite. You're going right to nitrate. Check with your bio buddy, ask him if they are one of the four. Nitrific, you guys listen. Nitrification does not start with nitrogen gas. What does nitrification start with? Ammonia. Yes. So from from uh, nitrogen to nitrite, or is that? It's not. Nitrate is where I told you it goes to. No, I'm saying. What doesn't? It goes to nitrate. What do you mean nitrite? When you're doing nitrification by bacteria. They'll go ammonium nitrite, nitrate. But lightning goes right to the nitrate. Okay, most of you got this. Nitrogen gas to ammonium is nitrogen fixation, but four of you said nitrification. No. Most of you got this. Ni what does it say? Nitrite to nitrate is nitrification. Uh-oh. Which of the following are involved in the carbon cycle? All of them but four of you said other things. Um, see if your bio buddy got eight correctly. If they don't show it to you right now, they didn't know it. If they don't show it, they didn't know it. Are they hiding it? Damn it, Krishna. 
<laughs> oh, only nine. Only nine of you. A bunch of you left off A. Most carbon dioxide in the air and the water mix with water to form bicarbonate. Okay. When it gets into the water, it's bicarbonate. All right, that's the end of that. And it's already 12.01. Okay, I want to show you just a couple things. I'm going to stop this right here. Do you have some time?